It's the lens, it's the lens, it's the lens, gotta live diverse. It's the lens, it's the lens, it's the lens, live diverse. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the lens, living diverse. I am one of your hosts, Ben. And I'm your co host, Nisha. And we have a special episode today. So today we're going to be talking about media and we have a wonderful special guest, someone I know quite well. That's she is my colleague all the way in Winnipeg and she has the same role I do. So everybody, Vivi, not Vivi, Vivi. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, Vivi, how are you doing today? Hi, Ben. Hi, Nisha. I am great. I hope you are too. Oh, thank you. We're so excited to have you on today's episode about media. It's uh, definitely it's definitely a fun topic, especially incorporating sight loss and uh, different identities such as race and uh, culture. So, Vivi, if you could tell uh, the listeners a little bit about yourself. Sure. I am the advocacy and community outreach program lead for the CNIB Manitoba Division. I live and work and play in Winnipeg, Manitoba, and my area of advocacy is the entire province. So Winnipeg, Brandon, and the northern and southern parts of Manitoba. So that's my professional role at CNIB. But when I'm not working on advocacy, which I love and which I'm passionate about, I am a playwright, I am a poet, I'm a performer, I'm a classically trained vocalist. Uh, I love all things artistic and art related, and I try to fill my cup and fulfill my passions creatively. Look at you. Oh my gosh, just a creative volcano. <laughs> wow. So definitely we're gonna we're gonna get a good episode going on. So yeah, like you were making and I know we talked about this in the past, you were making mention that you you do some work reviews and that's a consultation for what exactly? Yes, that's right. So in addition to my advocacy and my own creative work, I am the audio description consultant for VIEW, which stands for Vocal Image Ensemble Winnipeg. And what they are is a team of audio describers who are sighted. And it's a division of Sick and Twisted Theatre Company, which is a theater company that has an emphasis on producing and staging works of theater that are centered on or focused on or involve actors and performers and stories, including people with disabilities. So Mm -hmm. the VIEW team with whom I work, as I said, are a team of audio describers, and they create scripts for stage productions which are produced by Sick and Twisted or by other theater companies in and around the city and province. And my role with them is to go through the performance and help modify or adapt or improve the audio descriptive script that they've produced so that we can make theater accessible to people with sight loss, which Mm. I'm very passionate about. And I think it's a very important endeavor to be involved with. So this is new to Winnipeg. There is an existing theater company in BC called Vocal Eye who trained our audio describers. So there's been a lot of mentorship and stewardship involved there. And we're just really excited to have this launch and um, be a part of the theater and art scene in our city and province. That is so exciting. Hey, it makes me want to go out to the theater and then check it out. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, even with yourself, Nisha, like, how do you feel about like just the theater? Do you go to a nice little matinee or have you been any theatrical? You know what? I, I, sight loss is fairly new to me. So um, before the pandemic and 
before I lost my sight, I did go to plays and actually, you know, I loved them. And just before the pandemic started, I had tickets to go see Hamilton mm. in here in Toronto. And um, we had asked the, um, the theater if there was an audio describer that, that would be there to help us, you know, navigate the play. Cause there's a lot that happens in Hamilton, a lot yes. visually that happens mm. in that play. Mm -hmm. And they said to me, they're like, well, you could bring somebody in if you want. And I'm thinking, well, that would cost more money for me you know I, I shouldn't have to pay for something out of pocket to help me understand or, or, or view the play um, the way everyone else does like experience it the same way so I thought that was uh, that was really unfair uh, but then the pandemic happened and, and the show was canceled so I'm thinking of trying it again because I know the, the play is coming back and there are others I want to see and I, I want to advocate more and say you know what this is something that should be provided it should be an accommodation made by the theater and not by me as the attendee so absolutely and to your point Nisha the thing is about bringing an escort that's great and some theaters will offer a concession for that but the thing is the escort or guest you may bring isn't trained and mm -hmm. audio description as we know for anyone who watches TV and uses the audio description feature. It's an art. Like yeah. it does require special training and it's a craft and there is a technique to it. So your well-meaning friend, family, guest may do the best they can, but they are also involved in the theatrical performance too. And oftentimes, mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you've had this experience, I have, uh, they get swept away in the performance and they get yeah. caught up and they forget they're supposed to sort of be translating information to you. And you're like, what happened? What happened? Yeah. And then, and then the moment happens and then they've got to kind of take themselves out of the experience, explain to you. And then other things have gone on, you know, and the story has moved on. And now there's a little bit of a time lapse and a gap because of that disconnect. So the audio mm. describer, I think is a really important role. And, should be an accommodation because they are trained and they are there to be present to facilitate the mm. experience of the person with sight loss to have the same enjoyment as any other audience member would have. Yeah, yep. very mm -hmm. true, very true, and very good points. And Nisha, when you go to Hamilton, I can't wait to uh, to go with you. You know, because I'm a man of the earth. <laughs> <laughs> I would so say so, really. So. Even just uh, all this talk about like descriptiveness and descriptive uh, video, and I'm going to cycle this between the theater as well as uh, TV, as well as movies. So I know it's a, a huge discussion on how much should be described and us coming from uh, the sight loss community and especially knowing of uh, both of you folks where you uh, had vision, where vision... Uh, progressively, uh, I don't want to say got worse, but uh, deteriorated? Yeah, yeah, oh, I, I'm comfortable with declined. that. Declined, yeah. there, there we go, mm -hmm. there we go. Yeah. So I'm wondering, even coming from, uh, I guess, an intersectional background with like race and uh, different intersects, do you think it's too much to describe like a person's appearance while in theater or on TV or in a movie. So I'm going to throw that to you, Vivi, and then uh, Nisha, let me know what you think. Okay. Well, I do think it's a matter of preference. And as a person who was partially sighted and now lives with sight loss, I really appreciate that. And actually, this is a discussion that I've had with some of the VIEW team that I work with. They've asked me, you know, is this too much? Is there more or less that you want? What, what would make this um, the best experience for you? And I told them, for me personally, more is more. So I want to know what race the person is, if that's applicable to the story. I want to know what they're wearing. I want to know what their hair looks like. I want to know the perspective age demographic they may fall in uh, I want to know as much detail as possible because mm -hmm. I say of myself that I have a visual memory so I can call up 
those images from my mind if I've had a mm. visual encounter with them. So it just helps me, as I like to say, better paint the picture in my mind to fill out the scene. So the more information for me is the better because then I'm able to create an accurate picture for myself of what's going on on stage or um, in in the scene. So I, I just like as much detail as possible so that I can create the fullest picture that I can for my enjoyment. Totally agree. And describe everything. If, if you want to describe what the cup looks like, what's written on the cup, if there's a saying, describe it all for me. It's just, just know when to, to do the description, you know, I, I, instead of talking over someone who is, you know, in the scene talking, just know when to hit the mark. That's important to me. Um, but also what you're saying earlier, Ben, about, you know, someone's color, their race, their background, that's all really important to me, especially um, it has to be in context of, of what I'm watching. So for example, I remember watching a, um, a, a short story or short video on Netflix. It was just after George Floyd. And there's this uh, video where um, the man is reliving the same scene over and over and over again. I don't know if you guys have seen it where he's trying to go back to his dog. And every mm. time he's trying to go back, he gets shot in some way or another. He, he gets shot. Even when he tries to befriend the guy he's, who is shooting him, he ends up shooting him. And there's one part where he is talking to the person he is seeing, a, a female he is seeing. And I'm sorry to say this, but by the way she was talking and the conversation that they were having, I thought it was, a white woman and I had nothing wrong with that I'm just like oh he's he's with a white girl they're together whatever but then halfway through the movie the audio describer mentions that she's black and at that mm. same moment that she mentions that she's black the woman's accent actually changed she started using um ebonics mm. what Americans use at that same moment I was like oh wait why now like why now are you telling me that she's a black woman halfway through the movie and why at this moment when her voice is changing are you also telling me this like I wish I had known that from the start I rather than halfway through so definitely agree with you Vivi that you know knowing someone's racial background even if there's someone who is of you know Indian descent and they're maybe wearing a hijab or a turban on their head that to me is important I want to get those cues I want to know who this person is their background and, and things of that nature. It just helps me put the story together and put the visuals together in my mind as well. Exactly. And just the way you said it, Nisha, like these are all the visual things that someone would be able to assess so easily just by sight. So mm -hmm. we should have access to that information as well. So the description is just feeling in what the visual would be doing already. Yeah. So, and I agree with you. Timing is everything. And uh, yeah, that's what the, the view team works hard on. And uh, the other audio description team, um, you know, from BC that I've seen some of their productions they work on as well is to strategically place the description so that it doesn't detract from the performance or the, um, you know, the, the action that's going on on screen or on stage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. very good points. And just out of curiosity, Nisha, when you were saying that the character's uh, accent changed or the way they spoke changed, was that part of the storyline at all? No, it's just what happened was she, <laughs> she ended up using the N-word in oh. the movie. Oh, oh boy. And then I was like, okay, not anyone can use that word. Yeah, <laughs> I was going to say, that's a whole other conversation yeah. for Lens. That's a, yeah. whole, that's <laughs> no. a whole other podcast. No, no doubt. Yeah. No, that, that, I don't know. That just kind of took me for a loop because once the, it's almost like they're recovering for anybody who has sight loss to be like, no, no, she's black. Don't worry. Don't worry. <laughs> don't yeah, worry. yeah, yeah. Like, don't get mad. Don't get mad. She's black. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. uh, even with that uh, perspective, and I guess I'm going to apply this for theater and TV and movies, to be honest, I, I'm going to say, even if it doesn't have to do with the storyline, I kind of still want to know the race of the person. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I say this because I remember being told a story um, when I, at the school I used to work uh, at, 
with the kids who have sight loss and they took them to a play and this was so accessible. They would describe everything. And I remember at the beginning, the characters would come up and describe themselves, like their pronouns. Uh, they'd make mention, I'm an Asian uh, woman with long hair to, to my shoulders. I'm a black male. And I remember hearing that. And a lot of the kids are diverse, culturally diverse at uh, the school I worked at. And I thought it was beautiful because it's almost like, especially I'm, I'm talking from my perspective, and especially when I was high partial, I didn't see like representation. And, and being a person with sight loss, you miss that representation. So it's almost mm -hmm. like, well, I have never seen a black man in the theater yet. He could be right in front of me and I wouldn't even know, right? No. Yeah, yeah, yeah so definitely. I feel like even just in general, I'd love to know the race. I would even love to know the characteristics, blonde hair, uh, red hair, black hair, whatever, right? I, I feel like it's very beneficial to know that's representation, right? Is age yeah. important? I'm wondering because sometimes I don't care about age. Well, <laughs> if, someone, yeah, if someone's mature, if this is a young girl or a mature older gentleman, a middle aged Caucasian, like is is that part of the description necessary? I think so. I don't think. So. I I think so. I just think it just helps contextualize, right? Mm -hmm. Like, just I agree. Yeah, yeah, it just gives more context to the story or to whatever you're watching and again like just helps you shape and sculpt that better for your own imagination oh okay. so yeah. let me even ask you with that said just like we were saying contextualize and if it has to do with storyline what if like the age doesn't you know what i mean like what if it's it's not part of the storyline do you still want to know about age and how specific though i still yeah. want to know like they look approximately between this age and this age they may have gray hair um yeah yeah it's important because their what uh, their language that they might be using the things they might be saying to the other person a lot of what people say and do has to do with you know how old they are right you know, their maturity you yeah. know lack thereof or you know so. <laughs> and I also <laughs> so think, I think that important. I think that also is a part of representation right if yes. we're going to talk about racial representation there mm -hmm. there are many facets to representation gender representation age representation i think it's all very important mm -hmm. if we're gonna um speak about representation touche yep. touche so actually speaking of representation i want to know just looking at media in general so do you think and uh, Vivi, I guess we didn't kind of go in your background, uh, cultural background, but I guess you could explain it after I ask this question, but do you think- <laughs> yeah, Okay, yeah. We'll, we'll work backwards. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so do you think that you're represented in media, like a person who has sight loss plus your intersectionality, so? That is a really complicated question. And so I- have to say yes and no. Um, I do think more so now there is a lens, no pun intended, on <laughs> diversity and representation in terms of race and intersectionality. So I am a racialized woman. I'm mixed race. My parents are from Trinidad and Tobago and Guyana. And of course, I'm uh first gen Canadian. So there's all of those intersections working in my identity and I'm a woman with sight loss. So there's that added aspect also. So while I do feel there has been more recognition on racial and gender diversity and representation, I'm not so sure that um, the representation of ability or different abilities is as equal or has caught up. There are more characters I feel now in the media and theater with um, you know diverse abilities or disabilities being represented, but I still think it's minimal in compared to the amount of representation that is um, 
being seen in in the media and theater in terms of race. I think race and gender have caught up. I don't know that I feel the same about um, disability or um, stories focused on disability or just that include disabled characters as part of the fabric of society. I don't know. How do you feel about that, Nisha? I agree. I I think um, growing up, I did not see anybody, you know, with sight loss. It was just, you know, the the typical depiction of Ray Charles and Stevie Wonder. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. That that was it. Um, Growing up, I never saw them with a cane, though. So it was just the sunglasses, which was kind of (laughs) interesting to me, you know, because when I first got my cane, I was like, well, I know Ray Charles, Stevie Wonder, they ever had canes, you know? So um, yeah, but now that when you start to see more people with sight loss in shows or leading roles, they're dishuffled. They're not, you know, they're not shown as the strong, independent individual. They are more of, you know, they can't get their act together. They're all over the place. They look, you know, somewhat dirty and their guide dog is Unkept. I'm referring to one show in particular, but I will not say the name. Oh, and, I'm like, I'm curious where this we, is coming on. from. I think I know what show you're talking. Are we allowed to say the name? I don't know. I don't know. I'm drinking coffee, coffee, right? I, I, yeah. Now I'm curious. You, got, we'll have to. I'll have to we're, ask you off air. Off, off air. Yeah, for off sure. air. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and I know like there's a show and again, I'm not sure if we're allowed to say the name and I don't watch this show, not, not because of, you know, their depiction of blindness. It's just not a show that appeals to me that they do have a main character who I do believe has sight loss. And I do believe the actor is a person with sight loss. So, I mean, that's another obstacle that we've negotiated. If we're thinking the same show, the actor doesn't have sight loss, but we're thinking of the show. Yeah. Okay, so I don't watch I don't watch the show. So I I could be misspeaking. (laughs) But okay, so there's a show that I'm thinking of and the one of the main characters has sight loss. And I was gonna say if the actor has sight loss, then that's a step that we've negotiated in that, you know, people with disabilities uh in performance are now being played by people with disabilities in real life, which is is a good thing. It's a step forward. But if that's not the case in regards to the show, then then I take it all back. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, and yeah, I I I agree with you, Nisha. Like the the roles that we are seeing are kind of very minimal or very you know, stereotypical of what the public perception of what blindness and disability are. You're either the, Mm. you know, the innocent or the inspirer or the, you know, the, the model of, uh, of goodness. And I, you know, I want to see, I want to see a blind or disabled person who's like a villain or, uh, mm. you know, who's uh, a femme fatale or, you know, maybe has the same kind of hypersexuality as a leading man or a leading woman. So mm. those, those are the roles that I'm interested in and because they do exist in our society. So why can't they be depicted on screen? Yeah, yeah. And that's a very good point. And it almost makes me wonder because I was thinking about this the other day. I do, I, I try and research before I, uh, uh, meeting you know, before our podcast, try and watch some TV, look up some things. And do you think because it is the media, it has to be one dimensional? So things have to be exaggerated. So when you have a character who, I don't know, is, uh, I don't know, a truck driver, they have to exaggerate that character because it's easy for the, the viewers to take in. So when you start veering towards, okay, we, just like you said, a femme fatale who has sight loss, it almost confuses the, the viewers. Um, I, I, I think that that, you know, argument maybe doesn't give the audience enough credit. Uh, mm. You know, when I write, I assume my audience is sophisticated and intelligent and, um, you know, well aware or woke of you know what what's going Mm -hmm. on in the world so I think um I don't know that the media has to do that but I think in many cases they choose to do that because 
then it, you know, as you're saying, perhaps makes the character more relatable, more identifiable if you can um, create someone with these common characteristics, then yes, of course, they, they're more relatable and, and maybe there's a little bit of deconstruction there and there's less to navigate, but why not, why not give our audience the credit that they are elevated, um, you know, thinking people who want to engage in a performance or a show and create complicated characters mm-hmm. because everybody is complicated. So mm-hmm. why not, why not, if life reflects art, why not, you know, present that, that, that we are all complicated and uh, we have many facets to us and we're not two dimensional people. Um, you know, there's lots going on at any given day and time. Those are the shows I gravitate towards are the ones where you still see an individual or individuals who are complicated, but yet they're real. They can yes. be the person who's next door, you Complex. know, your neighbor, right? Like it still, it still makes sense to the world that we are living in. So. And yeah, that's the work of the creator, right? It's a delicate mm-hmm. balance to, to um, have those two things exist in a, in a character that you create. Yeah, and I totally agree with both of you. And that's even a form of advocacy, right? Because when you start seeing these complex characters who sight loss is just one of their identities, right? Like, Mm -hmm. I always, for some reason, I always picture the show and and Vivi, maybe you could help me write this since you're you're a writer. Maybe maybe I could leave this advocacy gig and become a writer, you know? (laughs) (laughs) You can do both, and Exactly. Become an actor. Yeah, don't quit your day job. (laughs) But the lovely thing, like, I want to see is almost like a group of friends and everybody's just a group of friends and they have that one person with, like, sight loss, right? Mm -hmm. And they have their own personality. It's not like the, the sight loss is their character. You know what I mean? Yes, exactly. Yeah, it's not their defining trait. It's just uh, a part of who they are, like their hair color or their eye color or the style of clothes they wear. Yeah, like, exactly. Like you could be that friend, Ben. I could be that friend. <laughs> that friend on the that show. no one likes. You know what I oh mean? My oh I, my god! Oh my god! Just like you were saying, Vivi, I want to be the villain. I always in a TV show, it just be like just be the bad guy. But I'm even wondering. With that said. Do you think that it would be some blind folks being like, why is the blind guy the villain? You know what I mean? Oh, absolutely. There's always going to be resistance (laughs) on either side, right? Like Mm -hmm. for sure. Like why, you know, why would they make the blind person the villain or the disabled person, you know, the, uh, the evil character. But I mean, that, that's a reality. Not everybody is wholesome and good. And I think um, a lot of, characters have been developed on that premise that you know the disabled person oh they're they're pure and innocent and good they wouldn't do you know xyz they wouldn't commit a crime they wouldn't have an affair they wouldn't you know murder i mean but if we're going back to the argument that blindness is a characteristic then blindness has nothing to do with you know uh anyone's motivations or um you know desires to uh accomplish their ambitions so it's just uh another facet of who they are more power to you you know i it's everything that baby said is is so true i mean just because we can't see doesn't mean we can't shoot somebody you know like that's what people naturally think is oh you can't see to do those things oh you can't see to to be a villain and to be evil how are you going to know who you're targeting, like all these things go through people's minds as to why someone with sight loss can't do something. And, you know, since media is something that majority of the world takes in, I think it would be a a great outlet for the world to see that we can, you know, be the leader, whether it's in a positive or or a negative way that uh, we can be, like uh, Vivi was saying, a femme fatale and have a sultry and seductive side. And, you know, we, we can do all these things. So, yeah, totally. And agree. you don't have to shoot. You could always poison someone. 
There you go. I'm not, <laughs> not giving anybody ideas. <laughs> you know hey, and if you want to incorporate that blindness uh, part of it, you know, just use your cane as uh, nunchucks, you know? Oh, oh exactly. <laughs> like, can we name drop? Yeah. Can we name drop Daredevil? Not, yeah. You know, they, like... <laughs> no, and you know what? Since we, we don't have any sponsors, we're going to not lose our sponsors anyway. So, okay. you know, <laughs> you know, so actually, Speaking of um, talking about characters that show representation, is there any characters out there that you've both witnessed? Because to be honest, I barely, I don't watch TV that much. Like my, still my new show is my wife and kids. Like oh that's, that's the newest show to me. Oh, yeah. wow. Like, that's, that's, that's so <laughs> Every, that's... Everybody's talking about like all these Netflix shows and I always start them late. Like, yeah, I always start everything late. So is there any shows that you you really could identify with or even movies or even theatricals, right? Yes. Um, well, I mean, I and I don't usually watch these movies, but I did see a Hallmark movie where the main character was a woman in a wheelchair. And that was just you know part of her character nobody else in the movie made a big deal about it and you know it followed the same trajectory of the hallmark movies you know the meet cute the romance and the happy ending and like it was it was great just to see that this character was integrated as part as part of you know society as a whole and there was a show that i watched back in the day i'm kind of a throwback to um ben um it was called nip tuck (laughs) it's it's, uh quite the interesting show if anyone looks it up and googles it and they i was so excited because they had a blind character on there and not only was she a blind character she ended up dating one of the lead characters so this was like you know a serious storyline and i i felt like validated and vindicated that you know that we've got a main character and she's got a romantic role on this show and then they had like one scene where they were together and I can't remember whose house they were at maybe they were at his house or something like that and like she had to had to she had to um you know get up in the middle of the night and use the facilities (laughs) and apparently like she mistook the closet for the bathroom and then i was like oh, like so disappointed i'm like no 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 obviously you didn't consult with a blind person and then there was another scene it was like in the same series where um she was left alone in in the boyfriend's car he had gone somewhere to do something i think it was in the store and like these kids jacked up the car and stole all four tires and she was in the car. I'm like, but she if didn't you're, notice, so. yeah, she didn't notice. I'm like, oh no, gosh, if that that's... was happening, you, you know, blindness yeah. doesn't mean sensory deprived. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, those, those are my uh, encounters with characters in, in the media in terms of blindness. I haven't really, honestly, I haven't really seen that many. And that's why creators have to go out and create these roles and write these roles and, you know, put put ourselves in these storylines because um you know otherwise we're going to leave it up to people who have no awareness of the lived experience to create these stories and they may not be accurate or true mm-hmm. exactly and then i'm going to throw it to you nisha and then i'm going to uh yeah that's the final question the final comments <laughs> well for me um this might sound weird, but there's a show on YouTube, not sorry, on Netflix called You. Um, in the latest season, there is a uh, black male who is gay and he he has a white cane. And mm. the great thing about it is it's like it's it's just a part of him. They never make reference to that he has sight loss. It's just when you're describing him at the very beginning, when you're first seeing him on the show, they make reference to him. So that way people know, like like people like me who can't see, Mm -hmm. that there's a guy here with a cane. But the way he's integrated into the show is just a regular person. He has regular fun conversations and regular banter and joking uh, uh, conversations with people uh, on the show. It's just 
he's just a regular person, you know, which is great. I love it that, you know, there's no, oh, poor him, he's blind, or he can't do this because he's blind. He works in the library. It, he helps out, full-time job. He does his work. He, he's at other events. It's just a great representation to see someone in the community who's just included we always talk about inclusion and mm -hmm. this is to me so far i haven't watched the whole season so hopefully he doesn't do anything wrong <laughs> <laughs> but if he does that's good nisha right exactly. like that, he's, he's human he's, he's allowed he's to human. do something wrong yeah. you know yeah, he's yeah. To do something wrong. but he's a, he's included in the show and another one that i i liked it was just in a one episode it was gray's anatomy where one of the characters um she lost her sight due to I think they had she had brain surgery and something happened where over time after the surgery started losing her sight and instead of it being like a pity party this woman she went on to travel the world and have all these wild adventures and mm. she's even kind of a little promiscuous and you know hooking up with people and just having a wild and and fun time and to me that was it was empowering because a lot of people think when you lose your sight well, why are you going to travel for you can't see anything you can't mm -hmm. you can't travel alone you can't do anything mm -hmm. but here's this woman who's doing all these wonderful things and you know having great love affairs as she's going along so some people might not like that but i thought it was pretty cool i was like more power to you girl and yeah i, I, I love Grey's anatomy what episode was that i totally don't remember that at all oh that was a few years ago um, I'll have to look it up. It was okay. like 20 seasons, so it might take me a while to find it for you. That's but, fine. Um... That's fine. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's a it's a beautiful thing, living her best life, and uh, just mm -hmm. just in general, I'm so glad that you there is uh, some representation. And I feel what you were saying, Nisha, about that show. You that that's a big step because that's not just one into that's not one identity. It's not just black. And uh, with sight loss, but throw in the identity of uh, being part of the LGBTQ community as well. So that's that's huge. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. yeah. And for any listeners, if you're listening and if you have a shows that you know of, definitely let us know. I know for myself, it was a cartoon. I have no idea what it's called. Uh, I don't know. I think the character's named Coco or something. I can't remember. I'm probably the worst person to ask right now. <laughs> but it was a character who had a cane and it was a cartoon. And that's that's awesome. Like oh, I wow. Yeah, that's that's a breakthrough. And yes. I wish to one day be animated, you know, be like Fat Albert. Um, <laughs> even though I'm not uh, like Fat Albert, but still it'd be like Ben and Friends, you know? <laughs> oh, that's great. We should yeah. do that. I, I want to be a Disney princess. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I I want to know I'll be your villain. Okay, Ben and Friends, oh. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so no one yeah. we are ready out of time. So even any just last comments about uh, this this topic from any one of you? Um, I'll go first. Uh -huh. Um, something that I would like to highlight is with audio description with TVs and movies and plays and what have you, it would be nice if those who are describing the audio description are different people of color, mm. Black, Asian, mm. uh, Middle Eastern, what have you, because those little nuances sometimes in the show where people might roll their eyes or you know, mm -hmm. snap their fingers and things like that. I would like to know because it just it highlights the culture. I'm not just a person, but of the show that I'm that I'm watching. Uh, you know, certain certain uh, you know cultures they do different things. You know, with their hands, with their necks, just different nuances that I would like to see highlighted. And I think if the person describing the the show was of the same background of the of the actors that would really help in getting a lot of um, different aspects of the show across as well when, when describing. Yeah, I totally agree with what Nisha said. And uh, I think, yeah, the arts can be a form of advocacy. So if we want representation, we need to be creating the stories that we want to see. So don't be afraid to create those stories and work at getting them promoted and produced and presented because that's 
one way we can definitely make change and change the narrative is if we control it. Preach, preach, and <laughs> honestly, I agree one hundred percent with all of you. And I, I just hope moving forward, exactly what we were having a conversation, just more diversity, more intersectionalities, more complexities, and more Ben on your TV. Because no, my oh, my, my show is going to be coming out. Don't ben worry. and friends, I ben love it. I want to do this. I want to do this. Be a writer, so we. <laughs> okay, we need an animator. Shout out to anyone out there who wants to work on this project with us. <laughs> exactly. Hit, hit Ben up because I'm not on social, so. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, Vivi, not Vivi, Vivi. That's right. Yes. Thank you Vivi. so very much for coming on to this episode, and honestly, we want you back. Please come back. To I would episode. love to. Yeah. This has just been such fun. Thank you guys so much. Anytime. I'm working on my second play. So oh. that is awesome. Well, I'll check that out, everybody, for sure. So wonderful. Very good point. And VB, any last comments for you? Thank you for listening to the Lens Living Diverse. I was one of your hosts, Ben. And I'm your other co-host, Nisha. Peace. Bye. Thank you for listening to The Lens, A Living Diverse. If you like today's podcast, please press subscribe so you could get notifications on any new episodes. Also, if you like the conversation of diversity and inclusion and intersectionality, please visit our diversity and inclusion page on the CNIB. The link will be provided in the show notes. <laughs>